nothing without you holding me up. Now I'm strong enough for both of us, both of us, both of us, both of us. Both of us. Welcome everybody. I'm David Ridley, the Managing Director of Arsenal Spirits. And I'm Andrew Day, I'm the Finance Director here. Thanks for taking the time to hear from us this afternoon. So we look forward to, to your questions as we um, uh, go, go through the, the, the presentation. We'll take those um, at the end. Um, but by way of introduction in terms of the Arsenal Spirits Company, you know, in simple terms, you know, we mature, we create, and we sell outstanding, high value, limited edition whiskies for a global audience. And really that is about Arsenal Spirits um, Company building a high quality direct consumer business model, again, for a, you know, a global and worldwide uh, distribution. Um, within that, we've been able to grow our online uh, sales to being above 80% of our overall sales and 70% of those sales are outside of the UK. And really our ambition is to create a highly profitable cash generative uh, business in, in the long term. And that is really about the key attributes of our business being high margin, high growth, really targeting the, the, the most premium um, uh, fast growth Scotch whiskey markets uh, in the world uh, and delivering that in a package of experiences that ultimately the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society are very good at doing. So really at the heart of the business today is the ownership of the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, a long established group of um, whiskey lovers who are paying members. Um, and we've got now over 35,000 uh, of those members globally. Uh, just under um, half of those in the UK with balance in um, international markets as well. Um, and it's important to understand there's real stickiness with membership, um, but also uh, something that we'll touch on uh, in a moment is importantly, we have a day one payback with regards to our membership model. We're also expanding beyond that as far as Arsenal Spirits uh, Company is concerned into a group of new brands as well. And late last year, we launched JG Thompson, a brand that is focused in on small batch blended malt whiskies and a range of other whiskies as well. And we'll touch on that in a little bit more detail further into the, into the pack. But also plans are well progressed in terms of launching an American whiskey proposition that utilizes all of the skill sets that we've developed around the SMWS, that being membership subscription, um, single cask whiskies, um, but this time a focused uh, proposition in the US for the domestic consumer um, and more on that um, in, in coming slides, but an opportunity for us in the early part of 2023.
what I'd like to really sort of encapsulate in terms of, you know, how we tackle the unique and exciting opportunity that we see for the business is really across three sections. First and foremost, we have a pioneering model. We have a, a, an absolute sticky, loyal, uh, growing global membership. And, you know, I touched on that, you know, day one payback, but also we have very high lifetime values with regards to the members. And Andrew will touch on that uh, in a moment, but a really engaging proposition that it revolves around, you know, a constant stream of award-winning products and, you know, our um, relentless focus in terms of innovation, um, but we deliver experiences. We're not just a whiskey company, we're delivering also that personal touch with respect to membership and also the experiences there. I touched on the fact that we're highly direct to consumer through our e-commerce sales. Um, so we know the consumer, we know the member, um, but also the content is delivered through a digital format. So we also know what you know, the engagement levels are um, with, with those members. And really those attributes really do create that pioneering model for us. That gives us the opportunity to really tackle that long-term growth opportunity that you see there uh, presented on the page. Perhaps if I sort of take it in a slightly different order to the way it's presented, we really have a significant and growing addressable market. And you'll, show, you'll be shown the details of that 5.8 billion US dollar market and how quickly it is growing. And you know, we're positioned to uh, take advantage of the premiumization that's really driving that growth and also the shift towards uh, e-commerce as the preferred channel in which to buy your premium spirits. And I touched on the fact that we'll be growing a portfolio of small batched uh, spirit brands, again, leveraging off our existing skill sets and not heading off in different directions. We feel that that gives us a really clear flight path to our ambition for doubling sales by 2024, and importantly, delivering meaningful profits in the medium term. And really that sets us up with a really robust business model that's primed to deliver on that ambition. So strong financials that Andrew will cover off in the results section of this presentation. The fact that we are ultimately seeing ourselves as a spirits producer in terms of the way we've amassed a huge amount of casts that give us a long-term coverage with regards to um, fulfilling growth demand into the future. And you can see there that in order, um, sorry, we've got 100% cover to satisfy our future uh, forecast demand through to 2028 and 75% uh, stock cover all the way through to 2033. Uh, and underpinning that, is really an experienced team that is passionate and engaged about what we do. And I'll hand over to Andrew, uh, who will cover off uh, the results and some of the key metrics of the business. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's, it's easy to see. It's another really pleasing <coughs> set of results. And that's now the third consecutive set of results post IPO, delivering on or slightly ahead of expectations, building on that. Long, long proven track record of, uh, of success. So I'll, in the following slides, I'll go through in more detail, but the headlines here are 25% revenue growth. So almost 10 million in the period and 20 million pounds of sales over the last 12 months. Underpinned with membership growth up by 24%, pleasingly growth in retention. And that loyal, sticky, high spending membership combining with the high margin model to deliver that member lifetime value, that profit per member of over 1,700 pounds. And on the right-hand side, I'll draw your attention to a new metric in the bottom right, which is a purchasing metric around casts. And it's saying that of all the casts we own today, over 45% of them were less than three years old at the time of purchase. And that really illustrates the evolution that we keep talking about, that investment in new make and young spirit which drives up margin over time. Buying the same quality spirit from the same high quality distillers, selling it at the same age, but buying it younger, maturing it more under our own control, and capturing more of that value. Now, if we turn over to the next page, we'll go into that revenue split. Overall, 25%, as I mentioned, with a really standout performance in China, 
with growth of actually over 60% revenue in that period, leveraging off the really fantastic 57% membership growth achieved during 2021. We also saw good performance in the UK, in particular venue sales, where we're campaigning against the COVID impacted uh, H121, as well as a, a small element of transfer of sales with members buying in person rather than online, as expected. In Europe, really good delivery there, um, particularly relating to our significantly improved post-Brexit route to market that we implemented at the tail end of last year. And that's been very well received, both in terms of member spend, but also membership growth. Now, obviously on the page, you can also see the US performance. And it's important to note here that we recognize US sales on a shipment basis, rather than a depletions and in-market sales um, basis, just as a reflection of the route to market there. And those shipments can be half a million pounds or a million pounds per shipment. In 2021, sales of those shipments were very front end loaded. So the vast majority was in H1. This year, it's going to be more a H2 sales. So in market, we see membership growing and that membership growth accelerating into Q3. And our intention is to ship more by the end of Q3 than we will have done in all of H2 2021. 20, uh, so that position will have uh, changed materially by the time we get to our full year results. If we go over to the next page and look at that wider PL impact, you can see that revenue growth converting into gross profit growth, which is great. Um, the margin point, H1 last year versus H1 this year, is a reflection of those US shipments that I just talked about. And overall, as we said before, we focus at this stage remains in growth and reinvestment with a very clear goal of returning to positive EBITDA in the very near term and delivering that proper bottom line profitability in the medium term, exactly as we set out at the time of the IPO. So no change there. And in the meantime, starting to incur some costs in association with Maston Bond and American Whiskey. And if we now as I see, move on to the next page, bringing to life a bit more of that variety around life, member lifetime value across all the markets. And really pleasingly, we're seeing growth and retention in the US and China, which is helping to drive up um, lifetime values in those markets. And I will pick just on the China membership number there, where you can see that the, it says year end, period end membership. We grew very strongly in 2021. We continued to grow in Q1. As a result of the uh, impact of the COVID lockdowns in China in Q2, we saw a small step backwards in uh, membership during that very short period of lockdowns. That's returned to growth in Q3. So a short term blip from a membership perspective, um, but no concerns overall for the performance of that market. Again, if we now move on to the wider balance sheet and cash flow, really the key message here is we are fully funded to deliver the growth plans through to 2024. The other point that we will come on to later is to talk about debt and to make it very clear that that debt should be considered in the level, in the context of our significant stock holding and remains a very sustainable long-term part of our capital structure. And I hand back to David to talk a bit more about that great business model that underpins and delivers all the results. Yeah, so I earlier highlighted three parts uh, uh, to the structure of the presentation and the pioneering model. And I think importantly here, the pioneering model allow, allow, gives us the ability to create substantial uh, value, particularly through the whole chain of the vertical integration that you can see on the top half of the page and the horizontal integration that we have at the bottom half of the page. And you can see on the left-hand side of the vertical, the current attributes um, that that vertical um, has at the moment and where we're moving to from a future state point of view. And Andrew um, and I will touch on those in a little bit more detail as we go through this. But it's important to note that we are increasingly buying newly made spirit straight off the sill, putting it into our, car, car, our own casks and putting it into um, storage. And we're very active with our maturation with regards to you know, looking at how the whiskies are maturing. And in particular, one of the um, initiatives that we've got is putting more of the whiskey into sherry casks because we know that uh, our members love the sherry influence and increasing that proportion quite significantly and putting an investment behind that. 
as a brand, we really um, you know, recognize the, 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 the quality of what we want to deliver to our members. And therefore we put it through every whiskey through our tasting panel assessment. And you can see there, we've won over 270 awards in the last three years, really demonstrating that our tasting panel are uh, acting like any other international whiskey competition and only bottling the very best of what we have. We're currently using third parties to do our bottling and labeling, and we'll be bringing that in house as a result of the investment in Masterson Bond. And I think there's a really important transition with regards to our bottles, bottled spirits, with regards to the gross margin achievement. And there are three key initiatives behind you know, pushing that to a circa 70% gross margin. So that vertical is really important in terms of capturing uh, quality margin. And then we go into our controlled membership uh, uh, horizontal. So you can only buy product if you're a, a member. Um, so again, that day one payback really comes about from the fact that members are buying not only the membership, but also their first bottle in that first transaction. Um, and that gives us coverage of the approximately 60 to 65 pounds uh, CPA. And then we ha obviously have the owned multi-channel uh, delivery within that horizontal, but in particular, that importance around the e-commerce where we've got over 80% of our sales. In the UK, we have four venues. So it's another channel uh, that some of the members can use, but extensively anywhere in the world, we're offering events. And again, anywhere else in the world, we're offering the award-winning unfiltered magazine online, uh, plus other experiences that members can engage with uh, as well. And that really gives us that really tight margin capture from start to finish all throughout our own channels. And I'll hand over to Andrew to, to look at some of the comparators uh, in the market. Exactly, and, and that um, fantastic business model that David's just setting out, is also unique, which makes the comparators difficult. So we've drawn out a few really powerful comparative metrics here. First of all, gross margin. And when you look at some fantastic businesses like Diageo, Pernod Ricard or Brown Foreman, generating in the 40% in the margins on a like-for-like -like basis with our 63% margin in the period. In the second area, around the book value, purchase price essentially of our maturing stock, as of last week, that represented almost 50% of our market cap. So in other words, half of our market cap is underpinned by the purchase price of the stock we've got in the books. And obviously that's an appreciating asset. We'll talk later on about it's significantly higher retail value or even you know, current market value than that level. And then finally, from a premiumization perspective, there's not too many public data points available here, but if we look at Diageo as an example, their super premium plus portfolio, that's the luxury element, grew by over 30% this year and now contributed just over a quarter of their sales. By contrast, 100% of our sales are in that space. And actually, not just super premium, 100% of our sales are in the ultra premium price points and above. So really, so well placed to take advantage of that premiumization. So that's one set of comparator stats. And on the next page, you can see another core element of our proposition. Now, we've already touched on some of these great metrics around that loyal, valuable, growing global membership. But another element I'd just like to bring to life here is we've talked before about the substantial value that we've got captured in stock. We'll talk more about that later on. But here, the substantial value of those members. And on an aggregate basis, in other words, take the left-hand number, multiply it by the right-hand number, We've got over 60 million pounds worth of aggregate global member lifetime value. And that shows the really fantastic value that exists because our members are super engaged in the proposition and how we deliver and just how important it is for us to get that proposition right, which we continue to do in spades. So we've now got that fantastic membership and pass back to David to talk about the product that we're selling. Yeah, so really a, a unique and award-winning product range that we have on offer. And there's really six attributes uh, that really drive um, you know, demand and interest in, in these products. First and foremost, they're limited edition. So each cask will typically yield about 250 bottles. And that's at cask strength. Now, 
once those 250 bottles are sold, they're sold forever uh, and we won't repeat that particular product. A wide variety. So we're offering you know, over a thousand different whiskies a year to our members across 12 different flavor profiles to help the member navigate ultimately uh, that vast um, variety. But again, on the basis of that limited edition, um, there is the fear of missing out. So when these products get released, there is high demand for, for members in order to get access uh, to that variety. And we continue to innovate and provide original products with a real level of you know, individual pers personality in the way we actually offer those uh, to, the, to the market. We touched on you know, the outstanding quality of, of our products. And you can see there, it's come from a wide range of international uh, wines and spirits competitions uh, from around the world. And we also offer you know, a great range of price points in terms of accessibility at 45 pounds, all the way through to two and a half thousand pounds, depending on your budget uh, and circumstances. But you know, it's underpinned also by the high desirability of the range that we have, whether it be through the age, whether it be through um, you know, the proportion that we have on offer with our uh, ex sherry cask program. Uh, but also we know that you know, peated whiskey is highly desirable and we have you know, a very good mix of peated whiskey there. So there's so many aspects for which a member will come back to look at how the product's different and repeat purchase. And we're doing you know, a very good job of that. Um, and moving on to the, to the next part, just a couple of attributes in terms of some research that we've done recently with the members just to highlight. You know, they're in the center of the page. We know that our members you know, love uh, our members room, you know, very positive responses uh, with regards to that, but also you know, very positive response around you know, the quality of our tastings. You know, we're all about you know, providing the world's most colorful whiskey experiences. So it's more than just simply a, you know, a tasting of whiskey. It's also about the entertainment um, and other education that we can provide with regards to a tasting. And if we also move on to um, our direct consumer aspects on the next page, um, you know, it's really important for us to, to, to have a data rich environment by which we can get to know the members, uh, but also to provide that digital content. Uh, I touched on earlier that you know, more than 80% of our revenues are now generated online, but also our members love their award winning unfiltered magazine and the content and the education that that also provides part of their membership as well. Now, if I move on now to look at how that pioneering uh, model translates into the long-term uh, global growth opportunity, um, I'll just outline briefly our strategic framework. And in a more immediate sense, our focus is on doubling sales through to 2024. The purpose uh, that we have is really centered around what we've been discussing um, in, in the previous slides, offering a unique and outstanding range of whiskies and captivating a global community of whiskey adventurers. That is our core focus in terms of how we're going to drive that business forward. And we're very, very focused with regards to that purpose. And that proposition then ties into what we're, I've been saying and Andrew's been saying about you know, creating, curating and selling outstanding limited edition whiskies to that audience. As we're moving forward um, with, with post IPO, um, our ambition now extends further beyond 2024 and really to create a highly profitable cash generative uh, business by utilizing the attributes that we've touched on, that we're a global organization, we're premium, we're high quality, high margin. Uh, and as a business, we offer you know, great whiskey experiences to keep our members engaged. And certainly the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society is a, a key part of that long-term ambition and that shorter term uh, ambition in, in order to double sales, in order to build scale through to 2024. We've touched on those strengths across the um, middle there, um, and we're really focused around five strategic pillars, and that's growing membership, um, growing our digital experience uh, for members and, and driving both you know, value and volume of uh, liquid. Um, we'll touch on um, the, the new brands um, and sort of extending our audience reach um, and making sure that ultimately um, uh, we have the best team 
um, to deliver with regards to um, our ambitions. If I move, move ahead in terms of just outlining a little bit more detail around that enormous um, um, you know, um, addressable market that we have, I think importantly here, what's driving that is premiumization. It's the consumer driving that premiumization. And what, what are they seeking? Well, on the left-hand side there, you can see that authenticity and status is a key attribute to drive the premiumization. And we really see that Scotch whiskey aligns very uh, well with authenticity and status, particularly our own product where the individual nature of the distillery, the cask, the day the product was distilled, absolutely you know, falls into that um, uh, category very, very strongly. We can see other attributes that are also then starting to evolve the size and scale of what we've defined as ultra premium and above uh, price points. Um, and you can see on the right hand side, the orange box there, anything above 35 pounds, according to the International Wines and Spirits Research is defined as ultra premium. Um, and the, the price points above that uh, ultimately are worth 7.6 billion US dollars and they're growing fast. And in fact, in 2021, the growth has accelerated uh, there. So a very attractive market to go out after with that consumer premiumization. And if I move on to the next slide, we can give you a little bit more detail about how that is defined from an addressable individual market perspective. And what we've done here is we've defined our addressable markets across a number of areas. So first and foremost, it's only Scotch whiskey. It's those price points that we referred to in the earlier slide of ultra premium and above. It's domestic markets only, so we've cut duty free out but it's also only markets that we have a presence in and we can actually drive sales in those markets. And you can see there that the top eight of those markets represent um, you know, almost 80% of the overall opportunity um, uh, in, in order to um, you know, achieve that addressable market, um, but also you know, an important um, um, amount of other markets uh, there to make up that overall 5.8 billion, um, which is, you know, you can see there on the top left-hand side has grown by over 200%, and in more recent times, um, you know, quite accelerated growth uh, there as well. This significant presence across the key markets, US being 1.75 billion, e-commerce, really strong driver of uh, that growth, but also we're finding that in, all, in, in addition to the convenience of e-commerce, that consumers are ultimately prepared to pay higher prices through e-commerce channels. See there, China is already almost a 1 billion US dollar market for us, and we're active across a range of uh, e-commerce platforms such as Tmall and JD.com. And the UK and Europe are sizable uh, markets, also fast growing uh, at $1.5 billion uh, as well. So quite an exciting market where we have relatively low market shares. So we see that there's you know, ample uh, growth opportunity within the addressable markets. And if I move on now, in order to <coughs> cover off <coughs> those additional brand opportunities that we touched on earlier, in November, 2021, we launched JG Thompson. Its focus is around creating small batch blended malt whiskies, plus a range of other, other spirits that really hold true to JG Thompson as a company. And JG Thompson um, <clears throat> relates to the, the vaults at Leith where the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society today is uh, based. <clears throat> and that ultimately the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society purchased the vaults from JG Thompson, a very renowned blender of uh, whiskies, and we've resurrected that brand. <clears throat> And in terms of, I touched on sort of leverage of our existing skill sets with the expansion of brands. <clears throat> you can see there that we've also got the award-winning uh, approach that we take to creating whiskies, where we've won awards across a number of international competitions. So, so far, good momentum uh, across uh, the UK, where we initially launched uh, late last year. We've had our first order through to France, uh, where Maison de Whiskey are doing the distribution uh, there and have an extensive range of carvists 
uh, to go seek new listings with, um, and um, discussions are well progressed with regards to expanding into the US. A separate opportunity for us <coughs> is, Anna, if you can go back, sorry. Separate opportunity for us on the right-hand side is taking and leveraging our experiences with the SMWS into an American whiskey proposition. And it's also a sizable market of 1.4 billion US dollars for the domestic American whiskey market, again, defined by those ultra premium price points and above. Premiumization again, as a trend is driving that growth. And you can see there that in those price points that we're targeting over a thousand percent growth in the last decade, five times that of the total American whiskey market. And we're gonna focus in on American single malt whiskey, whereby we've got um, upcoming legislation that will define the category, which will help people really focus what American single malt whiskey is about. And we know that we've got an extensive range of distilleries in which we can buy American whiskey uh, or single malt whiskey from uh, as well. So, so far we've done market research uh, that the consumers have really um, you know, scored very, very highly what the proposition is about um, and the engagement that it provides. We've gone into now um, uh, brand development work, which will be ready by the end of the year. And we're looking for a H1 launch uh, for that proposition next year. None of that is in any of the numbers that we've got. So it will be incremental to the opportunity that we've uh, currently presented. And I'll move on now and hand over to Andrew, who will ultimately pull together all of those factors that we've just covered off and why we've got such a robust business model that's primed to deliver for the future. Absolutely. So we've, we've been through that pioneering model, we've looked at the long-term growth opportunity, and now as we start looking at the robust business nature, it's useful just to remind ourselves that on average, the bottle has over 60 pounds of gross profit today. And on the page here, a range of initiatives to help drive that up over time. Some of that is around revenue increase, for example, more exherica, some of it is around cost reduction. And I'll go through each of them in turn on the next page, but I'll take you through from a chronological perspective. So if we look at the next page, the first one in train is Masterton Bond. So that's bringing supply chain in-house due to be operational in the coming months, that will generate a couple of percentage point margin uplift once fully operational, so we will get that benefit in 2023. Moving on from there, in the medium term, that ex-sherry cask program, and in simple terms, buying more ex-sherry casks, which increases the proportion of our whiskey, which has an ex-sherry cask flavor, because we know that's a flavor profile our members love, we're willing to pay a further premium price for. So we're moving from around about 15% having ex-sherry influence in 2018, through to about a third, 35% by 2024. Again, generating a margin uplift through that typical price uplift around about 10% per bottle. And on the right-hand side, over the longer term, the effect of that uh, process that I mentioned earlier, we were moving more towards buying new make and young spirit. The same fantastic quality spirit from the same outstanding distilleries but bought younger than its life, so we can bring more of our active maturation experience, more of those like sherry casks and new wood and flavours to it, and capturing more of its value over its life. And that will drive up margin even further over time. And on the following page, another key point uh, around that robust nature of the business is our debt position. And just to make clear that when we're looking at debt, it should always be considered in the context of stock. So if you look at our current debt position, eight million pounds, or even the consensus forecast of year end position of 13 to 14 million pounds, that is a fraction of the bulk value of that stock as it stands today. So that's using you know, the bank's valuation for a kind of reinstatement of today's value. It's less than half of that value in, in cast today and, 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 and even less. But more importantly, because of our outstanding pioneering business model, because of that vertical uh, integration of our business model, as David said earlier, we can convert that 
30 million pounds worth of cask inventory into over 450 million pounds worth of retail value in bottle stock through our existing sales channels. So whenever we're thinking about it, it's very important to think of it in that context. And in, in any model, we don't see that falling to less than um, that debt increasing to over half of the stock value, a fraction of the um, springing tests in place from our debt facility. So it remains, as we set at the time of the IPO, a long-term sustainable strategic part of our overall capital structure, as is commonplace in the, um, in the industry. I guess in terms of, you know, what's supporting all of that um, is really an experienced board management team. Um, and that's really helping, you know, keep, keep the strategy, um, um, you know, fresh and, and, and on track. Um, but importantly, we've got a really passionate, engaged team. And a recent uh, employee engagement uh, survey uh, resulted in an employee engagement index of 81. Uh, and that is through the roof in comparison to the UK average and the global average. Uh, so we're really um, pleased that, you know, the environment that we're creating for the team and what they're doing, uh, they're really passionate about. Um, and that really rolls into the very strong culture that we've got everybody driving behind a, a single focused um, approach. Um, but also, you know, making sure that we have a sustainable business approach uh, within respect of that. And we're members of the Scotch, uh, Scotch Whiskey Association. It has a very strong sustainability strategy. So a lot of the, the whiskey that we're buying are from member um, um, uh, companies to the association who have signed up to the sustainability strategy, so energy savings, et cetera, that we're you know, getting benefit of from buying from those distilleries. But also Masterson Bond in its own right starts to reduce the moving parts within our business in its own right, uh, being a more sustainable approach, um, but also you know, the amount of recycled and recyclable packaging uh, that we're using also into the future. So I'll move on to, to give you a bit of an update in terms of current trading um, and the outlook ahead. And certainly, um, you know, the early part of H2 um, uh, trading has been very favorable uh, in terms of on track uh, for our um, financial forecasts for this year. Certainly you can see there on the right-hand side, as far as the consensus forecast is concerned, you know, very much on track for 21.6 million. You can see there, you know, very much on track for that doubling of sales through to 2024. Membership on a global level has continued to grow into the second half. Uh, and in particular, we're more than 36,000 members and a return to growth in China in this latest quarter. And I guess as we move, move ahead um, in terms of you know, current circumstances, you know, I think it's, it's really important to, to note that you know, part of our, our confidence around the, the 2022 results is the fact that you know, we continue to grow members, membership into the second half of this year. But also, if I can reflect on a statement made by the president and CEO of the Pernod Ricard Group, is that they feel that the premiumization trend will outpace any reduction in purchasing power looking ahead. Now, very much that's mentioned in the context of a premium audience um, of, of consumers, which is very much you know, what we're targeting uh, there. But there is very, very strong momentum around premiumization um, and that there is a level of, of sort of immunity with, with regards to that particular audience and continuing that premiumization uh, trend. But importantly, um, you know, underpinning that doubling of sales um, is the second half of this year will be you know, strongly weighted around um, the US in terms of revenue recognition. Um, and with shipments planned this quarter, we will have achieved more revenue than the entirety of the second half of 2021. So, you know, the, the, the numbers are, you know, uh, you, know, you know, very, very close to being achieved already um, uh, for the second half of this year. We've also got the Masterson Bond supply chain nearing operations uh, at the end of this year, and obviously having that full effect uh, come into 2023. Um, and then the exciting opportunity for next year with regards to the American whiskey market uh, and the launch of the new proposition there. 
So I think overall, I think we've made really good progress in, in H1 and we are really primed to deliver on our longer term strategy, uh, which is really to deliver that you know, highly profitable cash generative uh, business with the near term around doubling the sales 20 to 2024 in order to build scale and build our gross margins in preparation for that profitability and that cash generation. So I thank you very, very much for, for your attention and I'll hand over to Hannah to um, cover off questions. Thank you to you both. And we have a number of questions that have come in. Um, are you currently experiencing any challenges uh, with supply of new mix of spirit? So we've got quite a number of new contracts being signed up at the moment. Um, we've been developing new make spirit contracts now for a number of years. Uh, you would have seen by the KPI that Andrew highlighted in, in the earlier slide, the amount of newly made spirit that we've been buying already 45% of what we hold. So we're, we're seeing you know, increased um, opportunity with regards to, to new make spirit, uh, with regards to, as I say, existing rolling contracts. So typically a three year rolling contract is what we sign. Uh, and as I say, we've got several new contracts um, waiting to be signed. And, and perhaps could you give a little colour as well on supply with um, wood for bourbon and sherry? Okay, so in, in regards to bourbon, with the growth of the American whis whiskey, um, it's absolutely um, perfect for, for scotch uh, because the, ultimately the, 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 the bourbon industry can only use their casks once and then they have to sell them on. That's where scotch whiskey come along and, and buy up those casks. And with the growth that they're, they're having, there is more availability. They can't reuse it. So, so there's no sort of further sort of recycling within their business. So we're getting the benefit of that. And we're seeing slight reductions in the prices of the casks. For sherry casks, we have a very strategic project and that's dealing directly with the bodegas and having a seasoning program. So a seasoning program is how long the sherry um, infuses itself within the cask itself. <coughs> so we have various um, pro, um, pro projects uh, with the bodegas. They enjoy that because we're really partnering with them. The nature of our products, we give reference to what bodega we're sourcing the casks from. Um, and, and, and it's a, a sustainable approach that we have uh, with respect to the dealing directly with bodegas as opposed to going through cask brokers. Thank you. Looking um, across the water to the US and perhaps into China, um, are you, how are you attempting to minimize risk uh, in terms of opening up there? Will it be by online and local partners as opposed to physical venues? Okay, so our, our, our main focus is around e-commerce. We have a diverse range of platforms that we're present in. So we have the WeChat commerce uh, channel called Yuzan. We have Tmall, JD.com, um, and also now TikTok uh, commerce as well. Um, we have a um, minority joint venture partner uh, who's the managing director of the business, um, a local Chinese person, uh, so very acutely aware of what's always going on with regards to the China market. So we believe that we're you know, you know, very, very close to the market uh, with, with regards to that. Um, but you know, we're, we're, we're seeing a very stable uh, e-commerce platform for, for alcohol. Um, and as I say, we've got that diverse range of the different e-commerce platforms that we're on. So we're not, you know. Yeah. And in the US, certainly the intention is not to, to, to go in and open lots of venues. And in fact, in the US, there aren't any plans for any physical venues in, in relation to the kind of tied house and local, uh, local restrictions. So the opportunity in the US for us is enormous and relatively low risk, relatively low cost to enter and, and execute in that market. Perhaps then the follow-on question, um, will it delay overall group profitability, this entry into the American market? The, um, the American uh, market in terms of the American whiskey uh, yes. proposition. A big one, yes. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, you know, <laughs> year one does have, have, have a profit drag. Um, it gets to break even and then to profitability very, very quickly. 
Uh, it's important to understand that the overall model with regards to American whiskey, as opposed to Scotch whiskey, is that turn rate, the maturation rate of the whiskies is much faster. So we will be typically selling four-year-old whiskies uh, as opposed to 12-year-old whiskies. Um, so the model in terms of you know, cash requirements, et cetera, um, is very, very different. Um, and we believe that we can scale um, uh, this business quite quickly because of the sheer um, size of the market and, and, and the, the sort of um, responses that we've had from the consumer research and also the distilleries themselves in terms of selling casks to us. Yeah, so we'll have, of course, some small degree of, of profitability drag in the short term. But in short, does it change the path to profitability? No. We continue to be about returning to positive EBITDA in the very short term and delivering profit, uh, proper, meaningful bottom line profitability in the medium term. It doesn't change either of those. Might there be you know, a few hundred thousand pounds worth of costs in the meantime? Yes, but it doesn't change the overall path to profitability. Okay, thank you. Um, a couple of questions around inflationary pressures. Um, one, could you comment on them more generally? Um, and two, uh, if you have the uh, price of your whiskey um, already locked in, as you highlighted in the presentation, um, what additional inflationary pressures sit around that? Um, surely it should make you uh, far more price insensitive. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably take two, two, two ends of the spectrum in regards to, to inflation, in regards to correctly pointed out that you know, we are inflation proofed for the stock that we own. Importantly, we, we own all of the stock that we need, 100% cover all the way through to 2028. Um, and that you know, in the current environment, there is also um, what the nature of our product in itself is relatively price um, elastic. Um, and in, in sort of an in inflationary environment, there is opportunity for, for price increases, uh, notwithstanding then that the hedge effect of having all of that whiskey at you know, today's book value uh, already banked. Really for us, in terms of the inflationary pressures, uh, you know, glass requiring energy, um, but in the scheme of things, the, the glass bottle in terms of the values that Andrew was indicating, it's pennies in the scheme of things. Um, possibly um, duty increases, again, relatively small portion of the overall 61 pounds versus 34 pounds uh, that we saw that within that, albeit duty is you know, a reasonably significant portion um, of, of that 34 um, uh, pounds. But you know, in, in a general sense, I think the inflationary pressures are, are, are quite controllable for us given that they are for you know, bits and pieces of the product as opposed to the whiskey itself um, uh, moving forward. Yeah, and the other thing on the cost side is <coughs> bringing in-house a lot of that supply chain couldn't have happened at a better time because we're moving a greater proportion of that from a variable third-party charge, which can be inflated, to a much more fixed element of our own in-house cost. So again, that's another um, support to, to, to protect on cost pressures. How do you go about valuing your total stock? So, I mean, on the on the on the first hand, um, book value um, is, is is how we're valuing the stock. But from the bank's point of view, from a, a sort of evaluation perspective, there is a, an insurable value um, by which um, they assess the value of the stock. To Andrew's earlier point, the Scotch whiskey is an appreciating asset. So every year we're getting an uplift of you know, close to 10%. Um, and whilst we've got a book value of our whiskey at 20 million, the insurable value is 30 million. Uh, and importantly, we see the real value is converting that into a bottle of SMWS whiskey and selling it at the retail value, which is that over 450 million. Um, but definitely on, on sort of the, the accounting side of things, we've already got clear headroom between insurance value and also the book value. In the 2021 accounts, uh, gross profit grew by 2.2 million, but this was offset by an increase in admin expenses of 2.7. Could you provide some colour on the composition of this? Um, and was it one off or repeatable? And two, indicate what we might expect as revenue continues to grow. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the first thing to, to make the point of is we are very much in a reinvestment in growth phase of the business. We are building 
um, a business that can deliver a 30 million turnover in two years time. And part of that does involve a bit of investment ahead of the curve. So in particular, that has involved some investment in people, in systems and the platform to support a business that we now have that's ready to go and deliver a 30 million turnover in just a couple of years. So there is some short term increase in the underlying cost base. As well as that, there were obviously some one offs and not just the exceptionals associated with IPO, but some other non exceptionals, one offs, et cetera, that were, that were in there that will come out. But there is an underlying step change that we are well through in terms of that cost base. Thereafter, we won't see anything like that level of um, uh, inflation in the in the administrative cost base of the business. So we are almost there. We've still got a little bit of full year effect of those that recruitment and investment um, still to come. So there's a little bit more of that, but basically as planned to get through to that um, profitability horizon through to 2024, that remains in, in check. So hopefully that provides a bit of flavor around that. What plans do you have to um, refurbish the members' rooms um, and what would any associated cost be with that? Yeah, I mean, so, certainly, um, you know, we're, we've got um, refurbished pl plans for the vaults um, to, to happen um, early next year. Um, you know, there's a few hundred thousand pounds in CapEx um, targeted for that. Um, and then, you know, potentially longer term ambitions uh, with regards to that. Um, but also part of the IPO funds was also to consider uh, new venue openings as well. And we're exploring opportunities around that. Has anyone in the industry got a strategy to deliver the full peated whiskey experience without the peat? And if so, what is the time scale? OK, very good question. Um, I don't know that there, there, there is. Uh, may, maybe Campbelltown whiskey, which has got sort of oily coastal uh, characteristics with a bit of smokiness, uh, you know, m m might be an answer to that. But uh, peated whiskey is peated whiskey, and we know that a lot of members really enjoy it. So, um, you know, I, I think that um, the fact that we also have a, a good share of peated whiskey puts us in a, a really good position with, with attracting new members. Yeah, and I might be reading between the lines about where the question is coming from, but there is certainly a move as part of the wider SWA to make sure that that use of peat is completely sustainable. Yes. So if that's where the question is coming from, I think the answer will be a sustainable and continuing sustainable use uh, of peat rather than it being artificial flavourings or some other approach. Yeah, but, but as far as peat usage, the industry uses very, very small amounts. I think the nursery industry is probably... Um, you know, need, need, needing to address that question. Thank you. Um, do you have any exposure uh, to Russia, Ukraine and, and associated states that might be hit by that conflict? None at all. Thank you. Um, what are the current top three risks discussed by the management? I mean, for, for me, regulation is always, um, you know, a, a risk factor. Um, it can change. Um, and, you know, I would say that, you know, given that we're in alcohol, a relatively regulated environment, um, you know, to give you, you know, a, a recent risk that we've, had, well, two risks that we've, we've sort of faced, um, it was the imposition of US tariffs. Um, and, you know, I, I think that the industry generally has been able to, you know, weather structural changes um, over a period of time. Fortunately, in the um, example of the US tariffs, they've now been removed for the next five years, and we would fully expect that to be the case in the much longer term. But nevertheless, it's a postponement for five years uh, with regard to that. Um, you know, Brexit was a risk for us in terms of, you know, the treatment of uh, alcohol moving into, into Europe uh, there as well. Um, but, you know, regulation is, is something that governments, you know, constantly look at, um, and we're ever mindful of um, you know, where and how they might change. Um, well, thank you. Apart from that, a, a number of questions um, from shareholders who are, are looking forward to this um, strong news being reflected in the share price, as I'm sure are you both. Absolutely. 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 And we, you know, we are, we are very much focused on delivering the business results, on in, uh, increasing the visibility of the business, speaking to new potential shareholders and um, increasing the access to these types of presentations, events and videos to build knowledge and understanding in the wider market. 
so that people can see that really fantastic delivery, the great business model, the great opportunity that presents itself, and underlying it, the continued proven track record of delivery, which continues on and which yeah. we are very focused on achieving. Yeah, I mean, this is our third set, set of results since IPO, and we've delivered at and above market expectations. So you know, we're doing everything that we possibly can. You know, part, part of um, uh, our next couple of days is, is seeing new investors as well. Uh, so, you know, growing the interest pool with, with regards to that, but we very much hope that, you know, we'll continue to focus on delivery of the, the business performance um, and, and hope that that share price is reflected in, in our delivery. Absolutely. Thank you to you both. And we look forward to an update in six months time. Thank, Thank you very much. All right. Thank you all.